All right, so we will now get to the meat of today's program. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with Dr. Zach Moore and John Wilson about how can we be friends. So guys, come on up. While you're doing that, I'll read off a couple of quick introductions for our guest, John Wilson. Uh, John was raised attending Episcopal, Lutheran, Baptist, and non-denominational churches in Houston. He happily mixed theistic beliefs with whatever else sounded good, particularly if it had anything to do with Native American spirituality. That's very cool, because I have a little Cherokee in me. It's true. Uh, let's see. John had a convergent experience at age 17 after landing himself in jail for felony robbery. It was then that he began to take following Jesus seriously. And there's much more to say. John, is there anything in particular that you'd like me to cover off? I want to give you guys a chance to talk instead of sitting here reading. Okay, cool. Uh, now, a couple of quick words and introduction for Zach. And of course, my phone's going to run slow. There we go. So, Zach Moore, many, many of you should recognize his face. He's a founding member of FOF, was our first executive director. Uh, he was raised in a Christian home, influenced primarily by Reformed theology. Uh, biblical literacy was emphasized during his child and adolescence, and throughout the course of his young life, he managed to read the Bible from cover to cover. Anything else you'd like me to cover, Zach? That's about it. Okay, with that said, I want to get to the questions. Now, we're, we have some pre-prepared questions that I'm going to pose to the gentleman. John, as our guest, will give you first crack at them. Uh, but let's address the obvious one first. I mean, you guys have very different worldviews, diametrically opposed. Um, how can we actually, for us on either side of the fence, how can we relate to one another? How can we have a conversation civilly? How would you guys respond to that? Um, well, for John and myself, I think it started with alcohol. <laughs> Um, if I remember correctly, um, so I was working on a blog uh, that was called Goosing the Antithesis, and it was a very controversial, um, sort of adversarial blog uh, where I was really sort of taking the fight, uh, myself and some others, taking the fight to Christian apologists especially, and, and John uh, noticed some of the, the posts. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember which one perked your interest. I think evolution, evolution, maybe, yeah. And, uh, and he started commenting, and he noticed uh, that I'd said that I was in Dallas, or based in Dallas-Fort Worth, and he was as well, and he invited me out for a drink, and I said, sure. So that's kind of how it all started. Um, can you repeat your question again real quick, just so I know? I got lots of history. Yeah. How can you guys have a conversation? Oh, yeah. So yeah. Um, Finding common ground, I think, is always good, uh, naturally, and, and that's a pretty obvious answer. But <clears throat> I think a lot of it has to do with posture and how you take in information and, and the kind of stories and self-reporting that you're going to come across. Um, responding kindly, responding uh, in such a way that gives dignity to the other person, regardless of whether you think their beliefs are ridiculous or silly or even not, not even going that far even if you just think this person is wrong. It's just, it's basic interaction. Um, uh, Matt's story is incredibly compelling and it's, uh, there's, there's so much there that, uh, I mean, it, it hits you so deeply and, and he has reasons for things or ways that he thinks through this and that he's thought through it and thinks he's overcome. Now, it would, be easy, and I'm sure many of you have heard stuff like this, uh, particularly from evangelical Christians, where there's kind of the like, right, right, mm -hmm, uh-huh, yes, that's well, that's that's nice, but um, you know, you're wrong, and um, and you get that it's like, did you even listen? I mean, what do you, wh why why do you care that much that this is what you need to be telling me right now after I just poured out my heart to you, and 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 I think both sides have to recognize that, that it does happen. I've met many, many humanists, atheists, however uh, each individual wants to be characterized or labeled or not, and uh, most of them I've met have been perfectly nice, wonderful people. Uh, I've been to a lot of things with Zach. Um, and I've always felt welcome, warmly welcomed uh, by generous, loving people, and. Um, it never even crossed my mind that I should try to fix anybody or anything like that. And um, so I think just going into these interactions, going, how can I encourage this person in this? Do I, do I need to make a point 
Do I, do I really need to like set them straight? Do I need to, what, what does this situation call for? So for someone like myself who had, you know, a very interesting conversion experience and the crazy family history and all this other stuff, sure, there, is there stuff to criticize in my worldview? Yeah. Is there stuff I could be wrong about? Yeah, I could be wrong about every last bit of it. But there's a sense in which it, it's, I think it's okay, you don't have to lose much ground by saying, you know, I'm glad you're on the other side of this. Even if we fundamentally disagree about why you're on the other side of this, what brought you through it, you, you made it, man. Like, I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. I'm, I'm glad that is in the past and you are working towards something better. And, and for me, I think it's, what, what John was just saying there was, you know, frankly, kind of a shocking admission that you might not expect to hear from a Christian. Well, yeah, I might be wrong about everything, you know. Um, but that's something I think that w when I look for people that, um, believers, or they're Christians, Jews, Hindus, or whatever, I I'm looking for that appreciation, that sort of, that, that, that little spark of free thought. Um, and I think that's something that's really important um, for us here, you know, in the fellowship of free thought, right? So there's a reason why when we were putting this together, that's why we called it the fellowship of free thought. The free thought was sort of the important point. That was the crystallization of, of what we were about. And free thought doesn't mean necessarily that you're an atheist or a humanist. Free thought is about how you arrive at your beliefs. I gave a talk one time at um, a megachurch in Rockwall, and it was to a Sunday school, adult Sunday school group, and part of my talk there was about sort of how uh, free thought works and why I value it and why I use that process to arrive at my beliefs. And, you know, it resonated with a few. Um, it, it clearly turned off several, but, um, but afterwards, there was one couple, this um, you know, relatively young couple, that came up to me and they had this really sort of distressed look on their face. And, uh, and they were members there at the church and they looked at me and said, we really like what you said about free thought, like how that works, you know, cr you know forming your beliefs, backing them up with evidence and reason and not just appealing to you know, what your parents taught you or what your pastor might teach you. And they said, is it possible that we could be free thinkers too and still be Christian? And, and they were serious about that. They really, there's something about that that really appealed to them. They really wanted to have their worldview backed up in that way. They wanted to, to, uh, to have a system that they could rely on where they could take some beliefs and, and put them to the side, maybe if they didn't work anymore. And I told them, maybe. I hope so. <laughs> I'd love to see you try. Um, and that's one thing that I've loved about John is that John really tries that. John, in fact, he calls himself a Christian free thinker because of that. And so it, it, the beliefs don't matter. Of course, we have diametrically opposed beliefs, but we have a very similar process. We have a very similar appreciation uh, for how that process works. And I think that um, has made a huge difference. So let me ask you guys to open up the kimono, so to speak. For each of you, what is it about individuals who share your worldview that really gets under your skin? Um. <laughs> A lot. Um, yes, yeah, so... <laughs> I have, I've written a lot about um, criticizing uh, atheists and the atheist community, and there's a lot to criticize, quite frankly. And, and you know, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't become an atheist um, because I was pissed off at, at Christianity or pissed off at the church. I never had a bad experience there. Um, nobody touched me improperly. Um, I know all those things do happen, and there's lots of really legitimate reasons for people to be legitimately pissed off at Christianity or the church or individual Christians or whatever, that, that never happened to me. And so I never really expected to be an atheist. I never really went looking for atheism or free thought. Um, and so I, I've approached it, you know, as I would approach any other group that I might um, encounter in my life. You know, it's, it's full of good things and bad things, right? And um, one of the things that atheism gets 
fairly regularly criticized about is um, basically being an anti-Christian religion, right? Well, you guys are just no better than the Christians. You know, you're just, and look at us here. We're in an atheist church, right? So we're sort of, you know, giving uh, some more evidence of that accusation. Um, and I think in, in, in some ways that, that characterization of us can be um, accurate. Um, and I think that what really bugs me is when atheists, it doesn't bother me that atheists ape um, what Christians do, ape, ape their systems necessarily, but it bothers me when they do so uncritically. And when they, especially when they resort to the same sort of in-group, out-group, you know, you're on our team or you're on the other team, uh, and if you're not on our team, we don't like you and we're going to say nasty things about you. Um, that happens all too commonly within the church, uh, between the different denominations. And I would love for it to, to not happen in the atheist community, but it does regularly, and that's the thing that really bothers me the most. That's good. Um, yeah, the division, the division can be extremely bothersome in, in Christianity, too. I think there's something, there's, there can be a lot that's good about it. Um, the plurality of thought uh, can, can be extremely beneficial, and you will see denominations come together, but there's too much division, especially over, <laughs> it gets kind of ridiculous, uh, the kinds of things not even so much that we just disagree about. Like we, you know, I, I go to a PCA, Presbyterian church, and we have Baptists who are members, and like, well, you got to dunk when you're an adult, and uh, I don't know about sprinkling them babies, you know, and you're like, dude, it's... And they'll just, you know, it's fine, and you're like, well, we disagree, but we're still members here, and yay, we love each other. Um, but people who, you know, and historically, they're like people killed over this, and you're like, really? <laughs> I don't know, that's a little extreme. Um, uh, one of the things that bothers me at present is our social response, uh, particularly to political issues. I don't want to get political, so I won't do it. There's a candidate that I won't say his name. Um, but, but man, like some of the endorsements, it's just, yeah. Like, I've got to go drink, like, a lot of whiskey right now. I cannot believe this is happening. <laughs> um, there's stuff like that. There's stuff, the, whether we like it or not, uh, the overwhelming response of the evangelical community and the Christian community at large, uh, particularly in the United States, regard, regarding uh, gay marriage and just gay people in general is abysmal. It's... Um, it's infuriating. Uh, I, I don't understand. Well, I do. They're afraid. Uh, and that's terribly sad to be that afraid that you're going to spew that kind of vitriol and be so angry and hateful. It's like, what is, this is, it's just odd to me why that's been singled out. And, um, and people don't want to listen. You get you get often normal, pretty nice, decent folk who you give them a topic like this and they go nuts. You're like, I don't, I don't get this at all. So that's one of the things that absolutely kills me about, about um, my worldview's presence um, in America. Just that thing or uh, transgender rights, things like that. I'm just like, why do you care this much? Like, you can have an opinion and, yeah, read some science articles, be, but just being so angry and hateful, I don't, um, it's like, how, how much more un-Jesus-like can you be? I don't get it. All right, so tell me, for each of you, what is the most surprising thing that you've learned being exposed to each other's worldview? Um, I, I would say... It, it's been really surprising to learn how much doubt uh, and, and, um, and questioning happens among Christians. Um, because for me, you know, again, I can only go by my own experience. For me, um, there, were, there were questions along the way. You know, I was, I was a pretty faithful Christian kid and young man. And I, I didn't really struggle with my beliefs that much. 
Um, I don't know whether that's to my credit or discredit. Um, and, and once I apostatized, it was, it was after a, a relatively short period of intellectual um, self-examination. Um, so I didn't really struggle with it. It, it, really, it didn't keep me up at night a lot. And, you know, once I spent time with, with atheists, uh, free thinkers, you know, everyone, everyone it seemed was, you know, was considering all sorts of possibilities and, and they were open to lots of different ideas and, and different beliefs and, um, and it, was, it was interesting, it was kind of refreshing in a way. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't really think about where I'd come from and the people that I'd left. And, that's kind of why I, I turned around after a while and I started spending a lot more time with Christians. And, and some of you may know that uh, Sunday mornings when I'm not here, I'm actually in different churches visiting, um, just seeing what they have and just seeing what they're talking about. I, I, have, a, I have a love for, for Christians and part of that, I guess, is, is autobiographical. You know, it's sort of where I came from and, and the more time I spend with them, the more I can learn about them and maybe learn a little bit more about who I used to be and, and the beliefs that I had. Um, and it's also led me to have a lot of Christian friends, you know, like John, for example. Um, and I, if you know me on Facebook, you know I'm not on right now, but um, I have a lot of friends on Facebook and I have quite a few Christian friends. And one of the things that I do, uh, some of you who are friends with me on Facebook, you may have seen me ask questions from time to time. And normally I'll ask, I'll specify, I'll say, hey, my atheist friends, I've got a question for you. Blah, blah, blah. What do you think? Well, what you may not have realized is when I ask those questions to my atheist friends, I put that on a separate list. I've got everybody divided up. So I ask that question and only my atheist friends see it. And I ask the same exact question to my Christian friends and only they see it. So I get a sort of a divided answers. You know, so I get atheist answers to the same question. I get Christian answers to the same question. And one of the things that I asked about about a year ago was to what extent do you really struggle with your beliefs? To what extent do, you, uh, do your beliefs sort of keep you up and you wrestle with them and, and it bothers you and you worry that, that you might be wrong? And, uh, and the responses from my atheist friends were almost unequivocally not at all. But from the Christians, it was like, yes, all the time. All the time, doubt is a constant part of my life. I'm always worried. I'm always thinking, um, you know, maybe I've, I've got something wrong. Maybe I've, I've misunderstood God. Maybe I've interpreted this incorrectly. Um, and that was frankly shocking to me, this, this idea that, that, that Christians, or at least the Christians that I know on Facebook, you know, it's a, it's a limited sample, that they are so much, uh, they're so much more different than the atheists that I know in terms of how secure they are in their beliefs and how, how much more present doubt is for them. Uh, and so that, that really took me by surprise. I think uh, <clears throat> one of the things that took me by surprise was just how, but really I guess it's, it's just a riff on the same, that same theme, is how much we have in common. Um, I had a little bit, I guess, of an advantage in this regard. I went to A&M and got a degree in philosophy. And uh, A&M's philosophy department is very heavily analytic philosophy. And so, I mean, you, you're going for the kill. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very painstaking, careful. You want the logical answer, and, it's, and they let you know it if you, if you stray from that. But uh, so going through that, and then at the end of that uh, period, uh, going through continental philosophy. So that's where I learned about uh, Nietzsche and Derrida and Foucault and uh, the continental feminists, which are brilliant. I highly recommend you read them. And going, they're saying this, and it's, it's devoid of any religious language whatsoever, but there's so much there that we share. A lot of the traditions are the same, a lot of, uh, as far as uh, intellectual tradition. And you have these crossings over, uh, like the Catholic Church being a, a huge help uh, scientifically uh, in the medieval ages, and seeing things like, you know, you hear about the Puritans, like, oh, everything, they, they hated science and all this other stuff. Then you read about, like, 
<laughs> pastors dying from complications from smallpox vaccines. It's like, well, no, they weren't anti-science. Like it, just the, those kinds of things where the story is doesn't match up. And so, hearing all the stories about atheism or whatever else, and then actually coming into contact, you know, and like reading what the atheists actually said themselves, it's like novel, right? Whoa! And uh, coming into contact, and it's like, well, that's not how this apologist characterized this, and that's not how this guy characterized it. This is very different, and we actually have a lot more to say to each other than I was led to believe. And then meeting somebody like Zach, and <clears throat> actually, this may surprise you, I'm a huge fan of Robert M. Price. Uh, I've got like almost all of his books, and I follow him religiously. <laughs> um, but hearing him talk, and he, he's even, like, he doesn't mess with the people that he lives around. He lives in the middle of the Bible Belt. And was it DJ that was interviewing him one time? Yeah. DJ Grothy, he's talking, he was like, dude, you're in the Bible Belt. What's that like? And he's like, I leave these people alone. They're like super really nice people. I love my neighbors. You know, I'm not going to mess with them. This is academic. And, and so just, I was surprised by that warmth and that honesty and the fact that there were people that had paved the way to find this common ground and embrace someone like me with whom they clearly disagree so much. All right, so now let's get real. What do each of you find the most troubling about the other's point of view? Uh, I don't think anything that I could possibly say would be a surprise to John. We've, we've hashed these issues over. Yeah, we've, we've been friends for 10 years, um, so we got to know each other right pretty much at the same time that, uh, that I sort of became an active atheist here. So I just moved from Ohio. Um, I'd sort of gone through my apostasy. My wife was, uh, she's, she's not even atheist, really. She's an apatheist. She just doesn't care one way or the other. She, she even thinks what we're doing here is a little bit too religiously on the nose. Um, for her, but um, but I thought for sure, you know, okay, you know, so I'll be in Texas, I'll be surrounded by Christians, and that's fine. But you know, none of it's really for me, you know. So I I'd kind of given up going to church, in any, you know, real sense to 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 go and to commune with God and be part of this community. Um, but I was still keeping up with things online, and one of the places that I frequented was a forum of the Internet Infidels. Um, which is one of the few forums that existed at the time, and somebody posted on that forum, hey guys, by the way, there is going to be an atheist being interviewed at a Southern Baptist church this coming Sunday in Colleyville, Texas. And I saw that. <laughs> I said, what? There's a Southern Baptist church. I didn't really know Southern Baptist churches that well at the time, I said, there's a Southern Baptist church, I just knew them by reputation, I said, there's a Southern Baptist church that's having an atheist come. Now, it was just at an adult Sunday school class, so it wasn't like for the main thing, like kind of we're doing here, so we're, we're actually up on them now at this point, um, inviting a, a Christian. Um, but I thought to myself, I've got to be there, I've got to be there for that. And, uh, and it, was, it was absolutely fantastic, so um, it was a group of local free thinkers um, that aren't really so active here anymore. Um, and they were being interviewed by a guy named Kevin Harris. And Kevin is, some of you may know, if you follow William Lane Craig's podcast, he's Bill Craig's uh, producer. He produces the podcast, he interviews him, and he's been very involved uh, with the Reasonable Faith um, ministry for quite some time. And he had this really strong apologetic in, in, you know, interest, and he wanted to encourage that at his church. Um, which was First Baptist Colleyville. Um, and I just, I just sort of fell in love with the whole thing. I thought it was all fantastic, and, and it's really what propelled me into getting involved as an atheist and helping to organize uh, local free thought um, events. But at the same time, there was something really disturbing that happened um, there, and it was in the question and answer period. There was a young man, I want to say he was in his probably early to mid-twenties. And he got up and was asking a question to the, to the free thinkers, and he said, um, you know, why do you even bother doing anything good? You know, wh why are you, you know, you seem like you're good people, but, but why do you bother, right? If there's no God, 
There's nobody keeping score. There's no reward after all this. Why do you even bother? You know, why don't you go out and, you know, rape and steal and murder? It's a, it's a classic objection to atheism. We probably all heard it a million times. It was actually my first time hearing it at that point. Um, and the free thinker responded and he said, well, let me ask you this. If you found out today, if you, if you were shown something that really proved to you in your mind without a doubt that there were no God, would you go out and rape and murder and steal from people. And the guy, he, he choked a bit. He wasn't expecting that comeback, but he choked a bit. But then he said, yes, I would. He said, yes, I would. And that, you know, and, and again, I, I don't share that story to, to say that he is representing the Christian point of view. But that point of view does exist. It is possible for that point of view to exist within the Christian community, within that. It's, it's possible to grow up Southern Baptist and go to this, one of the, you know, better funded Southern Baptist churches in this area, outside of First Baptist Dallas. <laughs> we love First Baptist Dallas, don't we? Um, and it's possible to go through all that process and be challenged like that and take the immoral path. So you're, you're challenged on how you are going to respond to this. And now, he, I, I, I said he, he did choke, and that's something, right? He didn't just go right into it. He did choke a little bit, but he said, yes, I would. Now, if we found him today and we, he'd given, you know, been given 10 years to think about it, he might have something different. But at the time, he said, yes, I would. And to me, that is, um, that is the most troubling thing with, about Christianity. There's, there's lots of other things that are fantastic about it, in my opinion, um, there's all, lots of other things that, that I find troubling as well, but to me that's, that's probably the worst, that it, it allows that sort of mindset, allows that response, and, um, and that you could find somebody um, just in, in a random church in Texas who would say something like that. Yeah, that's pretty troubling. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> um. So I'm glad you answered the way you did because it's finding something that's like the problem with <laughs> the atheist world. Like there's one, world, it's not even technically a worldview. Like I don't, anyway, but so I'm glad that you set the stage because I was like, crap, I don't know what I'm gonna say. Um, I think one of the things that, that gets to me that um, I haven't really heard it from Zach or, or any of, of you guys that I've met, but it's something I've, had, I've heard often enough and it's this idea, it's this kind of condescending, oh, it's all just wishful thinking. And I know you like the spaghetti monster. <laughs> the spaghetti monster, it, admittedly, it's acute. <laughs> but that kind of like, damn, dude, like, really what it just super condescending. You're, all, you're just full of it, and it's just, it's so irrational, it's so illogical. And which obviously ignores this, <laughs> this massive tradition of incredibly brilliant people um, who I don't even need to say their names, but you, you know I'm talking about, and you could easily find myriad examples of absolutely brilliant, brilliant people who are critical thinkers, who have given us a ton of thought, who simply arrive at a different conclusion. And it's one thing, you know, I mean, it, if, there were some of us, and I guess there might be, who knows, man, but I guess there could be some, it's like, well, if apples are bananas, then I like pink. You know, you'd be like, that's nonsense. But these people aren't doing that. They're just, they're going, okay, well, look, here we have these set of assumptions, and here are these premises, and this is the conclusion I arrive at. And to, to meet that with hostility is, is baffling to me. It's just, I, I don't see how that helps. Uh, it's certainly not a constructive argument. <laughs> To go, well, you're just an idiot. It's like, that, I don't know if that follows from what I said. And uh, so, uh, again, this is, it's become more rare, and I think interactions like this really, really help. And as much as even I'm not super crazy about apologetics, I do think Christian apologetics serve to remove the fear element on the part of Christians to be able to engage with free thinkers and atheists and humanists. Uh, because before y'all are just scary and you know the witchcraft stuff, I just don't know. It's 
it terrifies me. But to be able to read and go, oh, I, now I know what to say, even if you think William Lane Craig is full of it, and sometimes he is. But even if you think that, you now have this guy who would never have talked to you, and you might have to kind of calm him down a little bit. He's going to be a little too excited because he think William Lane, thinks William Lane Craig is God or something, but or just a little lower than the angels. Is that how it works? So, but embrace those opportunities and again about the posture and just, uh, you know what, man, I, I disagree, but that's compelling or that's interesting or, you know, uh, I think none of those arguments work, but I do think uh, the argument from intelligent design is interesting. Maybe we could talk about it or just ask questions like this could be a friend, you know, and um, be better than they are. Give us something to look forward to. Some of the billboards, it's like, are you trying to hate us? Like, I don't, do you want us to be on that side? Because that side sounds like you're all super angry. <laughs> like, I don't know if I want to be that angry all the time. But some of, there was one uh, last year, a couple years ago, it was, uh, you can be good without God. That's saying something. That's giving them something. That's, oh, there's an alternative. You disagree, but I'm not an idiot. You're showing me something that you think is better. That's constructive, that's helpful. Because it immediately turns people off. I mean, think about if you've had a conversation with a believer and they're like, well, you're just a thinner, so no point in talking to you. You're gonna be like, yeah, that does nothing. You're just, you're shutting it down. Now we can't do anything. We're not gonna get anywhere. Um, so just try to put yourself in those shoes and reflect back on those kinds of experiences if you've had them and be that better person and, and do something that's actually gonna move humanity forward. Because whatever else all of us are doing, we all want that goal. We want humans to be better. We wanna be fully human. We want to love each other well. And if some of us need, for good or ill, I think I need Jesus. He's told me before when I've thought about leaving the faith. He's like, you're no good to me as an atheist. I like you as a Christian. <laughs> and I really took that to heart because there's something about this that is compelling enough that do I need Jesus to not like randomly rape people? God, no, holy shit, I can't even, like, sorry. I can't say shit, can I? I just said it again. <laughs> We can do the editing with Please. the thing. Yeah, that was Zach. Only, Christians don't cuss. Atheists cuss. Um, but like, I, I don't need Jesus to not do those things, but I was still kind of a crappy person. And that story, the, the reality of that for me was indeed life-changing, and it has been for the last 17 years, and I'm legitimately a better person as it continually informs my thinking from day to day. I might not need it to not kill this guy for cutting me off but you know, in traffic, but it is a thought, it is something that passes through my mind instead of doing the like, oh, I'm gonna cut him off. I'm like, yeah, you like, you know, like that kind of thing. I do think about that. And it is Christianity that has informed that and has helped me to not do that. And if it's a crutch, if it's a weakness, hey, great. Again, I'm glad I'm on the other side of that and working towards something, I'm trying still, and getting encouragement that, dude, I, I, I don't believe in, in what you're saying, or I, I disagree, or why this is working for you, there's a psychological component, whatever. Wonderful, we can talk about it, but dude, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it. And I think that would be something that ultimately is more helpful. And, and th there's something actually that you said in that um, that I want to underline the idea of, of apologetics as a fear management approach. This is also something that sort of blew me away once I realized it. Um, because apologists always come off, you know, so strong, so sure and confident, and they're going to sort of ride in, um, you know, with their, you know, the armor of, of the spirit and the sword of faith and all that kind of stuff. And, um, or they've got all these different judo moves that they're going to use with you, and all they have to do is like cite the right apologist, and then you're, you know, you're on the floor. Um, but I, I went to an apologist conference a few years ago, 
that was hosted just up the street at Watermark Church. Does everybody know Watermark? It's one of the biggest sort of non-denominational mega churches in the area. Their children's area is fantastic. It's like, it's like a zoo meets, you know, Six Flags. It's amazing. It is. I wish I could spend an hour or two there. Um, but I went to this apologetics conference that had actually been organized in part by William Lane Craig, everybody's favorite. And I thought, well, of course, I have to go to this. And, uh, and I went there, and Todd Wagner, who's the, the senior pastor there, opened the conference. And he wasn't really giving a presentation. He was just sort of talking about why they were doing this and why they thought it was important. <laughs> and he said, I've been approached by several of, of our members here who have told me that they are scared to death about what would happen if they were just waiting in line at Starbucks and they happened to strike up a conversation with somebody who turns out to be an atheist and they would have no idea what to say and they're worried that the atheist would have you know some faith killing you know bon mot or whatever some turn of phrase that would just you know suck them over to Satan's side immediately and that's why they're doing this, you know, and it, you know, it's a massive church, so it's really not that much effort. I mean, churches like Watermart lean over and fart out conferences that are more amazing than anything that we can put together. Um, but it was still, yeah, it was still really cool, really, really great. But it, the idea that there is a real anxiety out there, and it's, I think it's a stronger anxiety, it seems like, anyway, a stronger anxiety on the Christian side than on our side. It's, it's kind of like, you know, when your parents tell you not to mess with snakes, you know, or, or wild animals, they're more afraid of you than you are of them, you know. I think that's kind of the case with Christians. You know, we atheists, we, we operate all the time as, you know, sort of on the fringes. You know, we're sort of on the margins. There's, there's not many of us, and there probably never will be many of us. There's more people who don't want to have anything to do with religion, uh, but there's not a lot of people that do what we do here, at least not now. And, and historically, we've always been very, very fringe. And when you're on the fringe, you tend to operate from a defensive position. You tend to operate like you don't have any power in society, because you don't. So you're always, you know, you're, you're expecting the fight to come to you. You're always waiting for it. But the reality is, they're waiting for the fight to come from us. There were, that's why these billboards, uh, like John was saying, you know, there's some good ones out there, and there's some, you know, offensive ones too. But really, even if they're not that offensive, many Christians often get worked up over this idea of just a billboard that announces the presence of atheists, right? Just imagine that. Imagine the mindset that has to exist in order to just to really get freaked out just by finding out that there are atheists in your area. That is not a position of confidence. That's a position of, of intense anxiety. And that's not something that I don't think most of us consider. I certainly didn't really consider that. You know, I was, I was thinking more, you know, hey, we, you know, we need to put ourselves out there. We need to stand up tall and we need to, you know, sort of take the fight to them uh, because they've been sucking up so much of the cultural air, you know, for, you know, all, the, all of time, basically. Um, but, but at the end of it, they're, I think, more afraid of us than we are of them. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen. With that, we're at time. Everyone, show them how much we appreciate them.